Welcome to the Treasury Update Podcast, presented by Strategic Treasurer, your source for interesting treasury news, analysis, and insights in your car, at the gym, or wherever you decide to tune in. On this episode of the 2020 Outlook Series, host Craig Jeffrey sits down with Tracy Knight, Director of Solution Engineering at High Radius, to discuss forecasting the future of treasury. They share valuable insights into the top focus area for treasures in 2020 and discuss how to profitably overcome the biggest pain point. Topics of discussion center around cash forecasting, accounts receivable, forecasting models, artificial intelligence, treasury management systems, and more. Listen in to find out how you can better position your company for success with a brand new approach in 2020. Welcome to the Treasury Update Podcast. This is Craig Jeffrey. I'm the Managing Partner of Strategic Treasure, and I'm here with Tracy Knight, who's the Director of Solution Engineering for Treasury at High Radius. And I want to welcome you to the Treasury Update Podcast, Tracy. Thank you, Craig. I'm happy to be here. I don't know how many presentations we've done together at conferences, but this is our first podcast together, so I'm glad to be doing this with you. Definitely. I'm kind of a late entry to the podcast market. You actually showed me how to listen to one last year at AFP. <laughs> and today you'll be teaching everyone about some other high-tech areas in, 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 in technology, so this is, this is fun. Well, Tracy, um, I don't think it's going to be a big mystery what we're going to talk about today since we're talking about forecasting the future of Treasury. But I, I think for setting the stage, there's there are a number of challenges in forecasting. There's a, a certain element of forecasting. So I know you think one of the top top areas of focus for treasurers in 2020 is going to be forecasting. So why is that? And is this is this a new thing or is this a an ongoing development or how would you describe that? Definitely not a new thing. You know, it's funny as I think back to my earliest years and and treasury. Way back in the early 2000s, I remember giving presentations about cash forecasting and how to do it better. So cash forecasting has been a hot topic for almost 20 years. And certainly the number one topic and issue that Treasury say they want to focus on, uh, it's been that for at least five years. And so cash forecasting is definitely not new. Yeah, that's that's something we see too. Forecasting efficiencies, you know, moved up into a top category too. Same thing with security, but forecasting's been so high for so long, and it's um, people spend a tremendous amount of time on it. But you know, it's a, it's an ongoing area of focus, and it's an ongoing area of uh, I'll call it pain or or stress. Why is it a challenge or a pain point? And where in particular do you see it being the biggest pain point? Obviously, there's different types of forecast elements or components, but maybe you just give some additional background on that. I think it's extremely hard to do without technology at all. You know, you've got to gather data from so many different places, from so many different people, and everyone is kind of putting their touch on it where they're wanting to not be wrong. So they might be being very conservative in their approach. And when you gather data, uh, often from a variety of different people where everybody has tweaked their part, by the time you put it all together, you might be very, very far away from a, a true and accurate forecast. And I think that's what companies have been finding year over year is that they're forecasting and they're trying to involve all the right departments, AR, AP, payroll, taxes. They're bringing all this together, but yet the quality of their forecast just doesn't seem to be improving. They're not able to trust and depend on the forecast beyond, you know, a week or maybe a month at most, but certainly not a good quarter ending projection of what cash is going to be or where they can make very good decisions around debt or investment. They're just finding that there's huge variances. Yeah, I mean, the size of, the size of variances is a, you know, an ongoing issue. And, and I think I like your point about the, the quality of data. And I think in terms of some context for that, you know, if you have a very stable business or line of business that's not changing much, um, the quality of data can be less important because you have historical flows and everything's pretty much playing out. But many organizations have 
changing um, you know, customer bases, they're entering new markets, new countries. So the majority of organizations we see, they have a lot of new elements, which makes the issue of quality data so important because it's not just historical, it's new stuff. And that seems important. And your area of focus on forecasting has been on the investment side, on accounts payable, accounts receivable, uh, other operating flows, capital flows. Uh, what's the hardest part of the forecast uh, from your perspective? Yeah, what we've been hearing over and over again from the companies that we talk to is that AR and AP to a lesser extent make up the both the largest dollar amount within the forecast, but they're also the two most difficult categories uh, to forecast with AR actually winning between the two uh, by quite a bit. But that AR and AP together make up about 75%, let's say, of the difficulty uh, within the forecast. Sure. If the other part is payroll, that, that might be a little bit more known what the schedule of payroll is, percentage of direct deposit, bonus schedules, et cetera. AP, you have a little more control over, and AR is, well, you're, you're dependent upon your client base uh, sending, sending payments in. But uh, that's part of it. But I guess, what, what else do you see that makes AR so difficult to uh, develop accurate forecasts or forecasts that adapt to changes, growth, decline, change in mix of what you have? What, 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 are, you, what are you seeing there? Yeah, it's pretty hard to predict customer behavior across like lots of different lines of business. They're paying maybe in different countries, utilizing a lot of different payment methods. And to do that in a manual environment is just tough. You know, if you've got very few customers, then you really can get down and analyze their behavior one by one and make accurate predictions. But when the volume of customers is high, your volume of invoices issued is very high, uh, it's just about impossible to do uh, very, very accurately in a manual environment. Yeah, that's that's some good calibration. I mean, the complexity of different different business lines that act differently, might be seasonal, might not be. And you're right, It's if, if you had a few large customers, it's worth spending the time individually in depth and you can do it. But if you have any kind of volume at all, like you said, you can't do it without, without leveraging automation, which is so true of much. But um, you know, when you look at that leveraging automation, what, what's the current state of some of the tools that you see treasury teams using for cash forecasting or even AR teams using for cash forecasting? Sure, the most common method always comes back to the same answer, companies large and small, is that Excel is the winner. Most companies use Excel for just about anything that they knew, uh, need to do manually. Uh, like most of us, we've grown up utilizing it and we know how to do it well. And so they build their forecast in Excel. Um, they'll try to have as much history and trending information in Excel and to use Excel to build out the future forecast as well. But of course, Excel has its own problems and those have been talked about many times. And then beyond Excel, um, most treasury management systems also have a cash forecasting module. The forecasting module within treasury management systems have been around for a long time though. And still cash forecasting remains at the top, uh, the number one issue of, of so many companies related to things that they'd like to improve. So that implies that even treasury management systems have not actually solved the problem. They've just automated uh, some of the Excel processes. So you still, as a user, have to figure out what is the right data source and then build some type of model around the data that you're getting from those data sources. And so Excel still ends up being the tool, even with the TMS, where you might import from your Excel model into the TMS, or maybe use some of the tools in the TMS, but they tend to be fairly rudimentary, still depending on the user to figure out the best source of data and to build some type of model around it. So the tools that companies have had to focus on um, for forecast forecasting just haven't uh, improved or significantly changed in the last 20 years. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I mean, obviously, a TMS might have exact information about uh, the corporate debt when the payment schedules are, but they would not necessarily have as much information about a receivables process where the, the data, 
the information might sit in four different systems or locations. Treasury management systems in some areas are outstanding tools, of course related to all financial instruments. Uh, you'll have your forecasted and or actually known flows uh, related to interest payments or maturities for debt, for investment, foreign exchange derivatives, all of that. But then you end up either exporting it out to Excel or maybe manually rekeying those numbers in Excel. If you do maintain your whole forecast in a TMS, the TMS is used mostly as a reporting tool, less as an actual forecasting tool. The next thing I wanted to ask you about is, I mean, I always, I always think of you as your, your core ex- expertise is in Treasury. I know you've always touched on the cash conversion cycle. AR and AP, and I think you're spending even more time in those areas now. But um, l- let me uh, tap your treasury expertise. What is, what's the impact on less accurate forecasts for treasury? Where is the, where's the value in more accurate forecast? Uh, either way you want to approach that. Yeah, I think there's a couple of key areas that most companies are really focused on um, when it comes to their cash forecast. The first area is around the short-term forecast and those daily debt and or investment decisions that companies make. If you can forecast better, even a few days out, you might do a better job at making a more accurate borrowing decision so that you know, you're utilizing the LIBOR loans and not the same day prime loans uh, so that you're getting the least cost form of debt possible. And so that's the biggest one. And what a lot of companies find out that they're doing is really over borrowing to not get caught needing to do some same day borrowing. They're very, very conservative in their approach and leave a whole lot of money in the bank, which we know, of course, is earning very, very little interest, even if you have an overnight sweep. So while uh, I think the biggest benefit is on the, the debt side, there still is some benefit to forecasting even on the investor side, but it's kind of minimized right now with the yield curve being pretty flat. There's no real benefit in going out further on the yield curve and with longer durations right now, but you have to believe that one day <laughs> that will change. I do recall in my early days in treasury when I was a practitioner, We really worked hard to have a really good forecast for the next several days uh, so that we could maximize our CP issuance so that we could uh, invest uh, longer and feeling very confident about the longer investments that we made with confidence. And so it used to make a difference if you had your position set and could do everything you needed to do early in the morning so you could get into the market early in the morning. That's less so right now, but I think companies want to prepare for the future and be sure that they're ready to take advantage of that capability when the yield curve does increase again. And that's kind of the short term benefit. The longer term benefit is for both private and public companies. Um, Being able to forecast your quarter ending cash is increasingly important. Companies need to be able to forecast their income statements, their earnings, and report that to the street if they're public, uh, report it to their owners, even if they're private. And I've heard from several treasurers that that is like the number one concern that they have. The number one thing they focus on is ensuring that they are accurately predicting their quarter ending cash. So I think between that short term and that kind of midterm forecast, companies are increasingly focused on it. If a company is highly leveraged, of course, the cash forecast can be the difference between, uh, you know, being able to meet your obligations and and not making payroll one day. So I think the situation a company is in, you know, net debtor versus net uh, investor makes a big difference. But the importance of the forecast is is pretty much across the board. Uh, I won't ask you the question about um, those that are highly leveraged. They always used to be the best at forecasting, but I won't ask you if that's still the case today. Because I did want to shift over to um, the tech that's used today. You've been a technologist as well as a treasury professional for a long time. And uh, maybe you could help make sense of some of the acronym soup to our listeners. AI is a term that's used a lot these days, artificial intelligence. 
What does this mean and how does it benefit cash forecasts? I know you probably need to provide a little bit of context with some of the other acronyms out there. Sure. I think AI is often used as kind of a catch-all, and it's a very sexy term, and you see it everywhere now. Uh, When you go to a conference, I bet uh, 10, 25% or more of the technology track descriptions use the words artificial intelligence. So it's thrown around a lot, and it's used as a catch-all for anything that can fall in that category. So it might be RPA, which is Robotic Process Automation, um, ML, Machine Learning, or let's call it true or full artificial intelligence, which is more like what you see in movies where computers take over the world. So it's a kind of a, a real thinking uh, a being, so to speak. But what um, they mean is that RPA is basic automation. A simple if this, then that, some type of connector between two databases or two systems. It's used to automate things like basic cash management or maybe cash accounting. In cash accounting, it might be if you see a particular BAI code and certain words in the comment field, then tag it to a certain category or subcategory. The results are always static. Nothing changes regardless of the amount of source data or the quality of the source data or the results of the actions that have taken previously. It's a very simple process. A step up from that is ML, machine learning. And it's a little bit more complicated. It's where the system or the technology can actually learn where your results get better or change as the source data changes. So the more data that's provided, both in the forecasting world, it mean might mean more source data as well as the results of how the forecast has been in the past. So that more data being provided can mean better and different, more accurate results than previously. And so that's where that learning comes in, that the results don't stay static. It's not always the same if this, then that. Instead, as you feed more information in, the results change. And that's what makes machine learning a a great application to apply to cash forecasting. Um, Cash forecasting can be automated. If you give it a good amount of data, you can correlate what values really matter and then utilize that on all new incoming data so that you're getting more and more accurate results. You know, not everyone here is familiar with high radius. Um, Obviously, you know, we've, we've worked together and talked about high radius. Not everyone's familiar with the offerings. High radius is is a new player in the treasury space. And I, I guess there's a couple of questions I have for you just to provide an educational basis for understanding, you know, where you're coming from with uh, some of the comments on the industry, et cetera. How, uh, how do you see high radius leveraging forecasting uh, in the treasury sector, um, you know, you know, building on what you've done in the AR side and then maybe jumping into a little bit about the, how forecasting, you know, improves accuracy, how automation improves uh, forecasting accuracy, just to continue the dialogue we were having before. Yeah, high radius is kind of new in the kind of core treasury space, uh, but certainly not new to the corporate market and not new to forecasting. High radius's history has been on the integrated receivable side with applications that help with accuracy and automation around cash applications, uh, deductions, collections, uh, electronic invoicing, uh, presentments and payments, and credit. And within the collection space, we've always been focused on forecasting receivables in particular for our customers so that they can manage their collection process better. Now, I've, I've known you guys doing forecasting in that area for a while. How long have you been forecasting in AR, specifically leveraging some of the AI tools that you have? Um, Sure. High Radius has been around since 2006, and we began developing our artificial intelligence engine um, and applying it to forecasting AR in 2014. So even though we didn't necessarily always advertise as artificial intelligence, uh, that really is what our technology has been. And so we've been doing this for a, a very long time. We're certainly not new, not new to this at all. 
So in terms of how uh, we're able to apply artificial intelligence specifically and utilizing, as I explained previously, machine learning, we can integrate directly with ERP systems, for example, to gather in open AR or sales order information and things that are going to lead uh, to payments that need to be made for AP. We can connect with banks and utilize uh, bank files like a BAI2 file or MT940 or more common formats uh, like or, or the newer formats like ISO 20022. Um, regardless of where the bank data information is coming from, artificial intelligence and specifically machine learning allow a system to gather all this data, but then apply um, history to it. So every single customer has history about how they've paid before. It might be around their, the master kind of level data. So it might be the type of invoice, the date that the invoice is issued on, the number of invoices they have to pay, the amounts of the invoices, any number of different variables that are, are on their master billing level and on the invoice level data. So imagine you can take all the different possible fields associated with a customer and then figure out which of those variables actually correlate with when and how that customer behaves. And this is essentially what businesses do one by one for their customers when they have only a few customers. They might figure out their average days to pay and apply that to all invoices issued. Or maybe they'll figure out the average days to pay for their top 10 customers and then apply that to their invoices issued and come up with a predicted payment date. But it's very approximate in general. And in truth, customers don't all behave the same way. So in a perfect world, you would take all of the possible variables available for each individual customer that you have so that when you issue an invoice to that customer, you would accurately predict right down to that specific invoice when that customer is most likely going to pay, right down to the day. So if you could do that for your thousand customers or hundreds of thousands of customers, you would end up with a very accurate prediction of how your AR is going to come in. That's what machine learning can do. It can take this large amount of data, a large number of different possible variables, and then apply that to the forecast or the open AR as you're issuing them and come up with an accurate forecast. The same thing can be done for any category that has lots of data that you want to uh, use to predict uh, the outcome. And that's where machines really, really help. It's not about a machine kind of taking over. It's more about how you can manage large amounts of data and make predictive outcomes utilizing that data in ways that you just can't do when you're doing it manually. Yeah, I think that's interesting. I mean, this, this detailed um, forecasting based upon individual components has to have a good engine to do that because it's, you know, it's capturing more data than was available. Historically, you would run large numbers through regression, hoping for the mean. So it's just an interesting, interesting model um, to go through where you can forecast it uh, specifically. You know, in the, the topic of the cash conversion cycle focus, uh, I guess most of High Radius covers much of the cash conversion cycle, AR, AP, and, and touches on some treasury so I guess, you know, would you say High Radius is a competitor to TMSs? Every system starts to encroach on other areas, but uh, how would you describe it uh, in terms of the landscape there? Is it a direct competitor or not? Yeah, I wouldn't say it's a direct competitor at all when it comes to treasury management systems. Treasury management systems, you know, they have obviously there's a, a several of them and they cover a different part in space. Uh, within the treasury market, but they do many different things and they typically do them very well from, you know, setting cash positions and managing all of your financial instruments and the accounting associated with that and maybe hedging. So treasury management systems cover a wide variety of different things. Here at High Radius, we're really focused 
on cash forecasting in particular. So around that area, I would say no, that we're not a competitor with the treasury management system. Instead, we're very complimentary. In fact, you know, to build a cash forecast, some of that information in a TMS is needed in the forecast. So the goal would be for the systems to kind of work side by side where the treasury management system is supplying some of the data that needs to go into the forecast, as we discussed earlier, particularly around like financial instruments and the the known interest flows and maturity flows that are going to be happening. High radius can actually do more than just cash forecasting, but in this particular area, I would say no, that we're not uh, not a competitor at all. No, that's that's helpful calibration, and I know that um, some companies look for automation or forecasting. Maybe they don't use a TMS, but I, I wanted to spend the remaining part of our time talking about where you see the future of AI and Treasury more broadly. What, where do you see that? What is the what does the future look like? Yeah, I think artificial intelligence can be applied to a wide variety of different areas within Treasury. When you think about the opportunities that exist, they usually fall around areas where there's a large amount of data and decisions that have to be made from that data. And I think that is how artificial intelligence can be utilized. So when you look for specific examples, it might be around hedging, for example, places where a company has policies in place. So there are kind of like known guidelines that you're trying to stay within and you've got large amounts of data, maybe large amounts of different exposures and different currencies. So written correctly, a system could help apply those guidelines to the known exposures and make recommendations about what the optimal uh, hedging decisions would be, for example, um, around FX, or maybe what the optimal investment or borrowing decisions should be given the current state of the forecast. Those I see as kind of the, the higher level things that artificial intelligence can provide to Treasury. Some of the more, more simple things um, just have to do with high volume and looking for anomalies. So around payments, maybe it would be identifying when there are trends that a person doesn't necessarily see when uh, you're looking at such a large volume of data, looking for fraudulent situations where there are multiple, maybe small dollar payments being made to the same vendor, or when perhaps if there's a fraudulent kind of situation going on or some type of fraud happening in the treasury department itself with your own employees, when somewhere might be in collusion with each other, you would actually be able to see when there are patterns of maybe the same person initiating payments and the same person approving them and they're going to the same beneficiary accounts or banks or vendors. So you'd be able to uh, notify and uh, be notified of situations that are potentially fraud just because of the volume of things that are happening, maybe in such small amounts that they don't stand out, but that a machine would be able to recognize in a way that a human doesn't necessarily. And so I think the key is that we've all got to be looking for a wide variety of opportunities to apply technology to the human situations that we have within Treasury. The goal would be for us each to be able to spend a lot more time applying what a machine can't do instead of doing the things that can be easily mechanized. I think that true artificial intelligence, you know, the one I mentioned before where machines take over the world, we're not that close to that right now. That requires humans. Humans can take over the world. Humans can think and adapt and change to every different possible situation. So what we want is for the machines to be able to do these things within the guidelines that humans set and that we each spend our time on analysis and looking for more and new and better opportunities for our companies, for our treasuries, and for us personally, where we're challenged each and every day. Yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, we have, uh, we have more data in quantity, more data in detail, and we have better tools for, 
for managing and analyzing data and what those implications are and then what actions need to flow from that. Uh, and we need more time to do that, and this, this helps that. But as we close this out, I wanted to get your any final thoughts you have uh, for, for the audience. Yeah, I guess my final thoughts would be to not be afraid of technology, to not be afraid of automation. When I think back to when I was a practitioner, I usually had kind of a, a long list of goals for the year. And there would be some items near the bottom that I could just never, ever seem to get to. There were always more things on my to-do list, even things that I knew could add some real value, but I just didn't have time to do them. So think of technology and artificial intelligence as being a partner, as being a helping hand to take over some of the functions that don't require the, the highest level of your thinking and analytical ability. And if you're able to offload those, think about the things that you can do that really makes a difference. And I think you'll find that as you utilize technology in useful ways, you can begin to get to those items that are at the bottom of your to-do list, uh, adding real value to your company and hopefully making your job more and more challenging and enjoyable as well. And uh, knowing you, I bet you would add more items to the list as well once uh, once there's free uh, free space there, Tracy. You can never Tracy. stop. <laughs> <laughs> Tracy Knight, thank you so much for uh, for your time on this podcast, the uh, 2020 Outlook series on forecasting the future of Treasury. Really appreciate uh, your time, Tracy. Thank you so much, Craig, for having me. You've reached the end of another episode of the Treasury Update podcast. Be sure to follow Strategic Treasurer on LinkedIn. Just search for Strategic Treasurer. This podcast is provided for informational purposes only, and statements made by Strategic Treasurer LLC on this podcast are not intended as legal, business, consulting, or tax advice. For more information, visit and bookmark strategictreasurer.com.